Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Adriana Pantin. Uh, she is a postdoctoral fellow um, in CPMC's health psychology program. And um, a couple of Dr. Pantin's uh, areas of emphasis um, includes diversity and community mental health, meditation, and psychology. Her goal is to use her cultural competency and understanding of diversity issues in future clinical practice and to help reduce the stigma around trauma and mental illness in minority populations in the U.S. Please welcome our speaker today, um, silently from wherever you're at because we can't hear you. Take it away, Adriana. Hi, everyone. My name is Adriana, or Dr. Panting. Community violence. So if it was a family member, let's say it's a sibling and they are committing a violence against me, it wouldn't necessarily be a part of community violence. It'd be like more a familial thing. With community violence, we're thinking about bullying. We're thinking about gang violence. We're thinking about the public shootings, mass shootings that we've been seeing a lot more and more lately. And we're thinking of events that would cause like a war-like condition. Um, or like a terrorist attack. Um, what's the impact of community violence? Why, why is it such a big deal? Why do we want to cope with it? Why um, do we want to stop it? Um, community violence, of course, can cause significant physical injuries for the people that are involved, um, even deaths, as we've been seeing on the news, which, of course, can devastate families and individuals and, you know, just cause kind of a chain reaction of different effects. It impacts the development of kids, right? If I'm a kid, I have all these goals and milestones. I'm learning to read. I'm learning to kind of be more coordinated with my body, adding a big stressor, like having to worry about a shooting at school, having to worry about my friends being assaulted or me being assaulted by a gang that of course is going to distract from all the attention that I need on these really important milestones that I'm already trying to reach. Um, it increases mental health conditions and the people affected by it, or even people that hear about it, it can create anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and that can come with a series of other, uh, impairments. Like maybe my sleep is messed up. Maybe, um, I'm really worried now. Maybe I'm grieving the loss of someone close to me. It not only affects us mentally, but it can physically affect us. So people that live in areas of high community violence often have higher rates of chronic diseases, like physical health diseases. So what we do know is that stress weakens your immune system. That can be one contributing factor of why that might be seen, but there's a lot of other factors that go into that. Community violence also creates a lot of barriers. So it, you know, if I'm really worried about gang violence in my community, I might have to limit my outside time. So I can't be the person that takes, you know, a nighttime walk with my dog. Maybe it's really not safe to. So my ability to engage in these like health behaviors, like walking outside, bicycling, rollerblading, going to the parks, things like that might be impacted. Um, it can you know, limit my movement. If I don't, um, if I don't have a car and I walk places, maybe healthier food places are further away. That might be too risky to get to. Um, and that's also assuming that the health food places are things that I can afford, which oftentimes is not the case, um, in a lot of communities. Um, and then just participating in neighborhood activities, like, you know, a lot of times they'll have fairs in the park or things like that. And if I'm worried about violence in my community, that might not be a good idea or something that's accessible or something that I'm thinking of. Um, it has a bigger impact than on just individuals. It can limit business growth and prosperity. It can put a strain on the education system, on teachers, on counselors at school. Um, it can cause kind of a chain reaction that can lead to more involvement with social justice, like more kids in juvenile detention or having behavioral issues like that. It can put a drain on medical systems. People are having higher stress, higher medical problems. Um, it just slows overall community progress, um, which again, all of this overall contributes to disparities. Now, 
I'm in a neighborhood that has community violence and the education system is strained. The medical system is strained. So that can create kind of disparities or unequal um, conditions compared to maybe an area that doesn't have as much violence or that maybe has more financial um, stability. Um, And what we've seen with community violence is communities of color, low income areas are especially affected by this. Again, not because the people of the area are more prone to violence. It can be really systemic, like we're saying, you know, strains on education and this gets like perpetuated. So it's just further, um, it's making the gap between the like financial status of these communities and health and education. It's making that gap bigger to what other communities might experience that aren't having as much high levels of violence. So general reaction. So I'm going to go over kind of how community violence might impact young kids and adolescents and then adults. So just some general symptoms in youth that can be across any age. This can be a kid as young as five. It can be a teenager. Physical issues like stomach aches or headaches. So a lot of times, if you remember, kids go, oh, I don't want to go to school. Like my stomach hurts. Oops, I exited out. Um, So you might see that a lot more with kids of these communities um, where there's higher levels of community violence. Um, Why is that? Mm, Kids aren't as expressive as we are verbally. You might be like, no, no, no. I have a grandkid or a niece that doesn't stop talking, but they don't um, express their emotions as much as we do. They don't process their emotions through words as much as we do. So a lot of times it comes out with something physical, a stomach ache, a headache. Um, They can have nightmares or other sleep problems, um, including like kids might not want to go to bed. There can be issues concentrating, which imagine I'm, you know, not wanting to go to school. My stomach's hurting. Now my attention is worse. I'm having issues concentrating. This again can impact me at school, impact me in a lot of areas. Um, Less interest in activities that they normally enjoy. Feelings of guilt. It can be related to so many things, things that weren't even their fault. Maybe when the violence happened, I, um, you know, wasn't with one of my siblings because we got in a fight and they got hurt. And now I'm going to feel guilty about that. And with kids, kids can also have thoughts of revenge. They want the other person to hurt. They want whoever caused this to hurt or suffer. Um, It's kind of like an immature emotional reaction that is really common with kids because they're not as emotionally mature as us. But that can be things that we can see in youth overall. Reactions in children that are five years or younger might be clinging to their caregivers, whoever they are. If it's teachers, babysitters, parents, or family members, they might be more clingy than usual. And they might be crying more, a little more tearful, more tantrums. Um, just stronger emotional reactions. They might have some behaviors that are kind of like, oh, I thought we were past that stage. Like maybe we were toilet trained already and now they're wetting the bed. Um, Maybe we were done sucking the thumb or carrying around, you know, binky or whatever stuffed animal. And now that came back up. That's kind of normal with, with these stressful events. Being more scared. Like now, all of a sudden the kid is just scared of the dark or they're scared of some monsters where this wasn't really the case before. And then they might incorporate aspects of the traumatic event into their play. So like I said, kids don't really go, hi, I'm feeling sad today. This is what happened. It made me think this, that's like kind of a more adult thing. And even some adults don't communicate like like that. Kids are more likely to show that something's off through play. Cause that's like their whole lives. You know, they love play. And that's how they learn. So maybe they're playing house and, you know, it's whatever happened in the community is going to come out in in their play. Um, Maybe their art has changed. Like they used to color in one way and now it's different colors. Now it's a lot of scribbles. Now there's like a bad monster or something in the art. Um, or maybe they're going to write stories. They, oh, the, the big bad wolf and the big bad wolf is this person who is in this violent event. So these can be things to look out for with kids. Um, with a little older kids. So we were talking about five years old before. Now we're talking about 
you know, kids that are in school, even teens, adolescents, they might have issues at school. So maybe their behavior is different. They're getting in more fights on the playground. They're not sharing as much. Maybe their grades have changed. You know, they were really good at this one class before, and now they're getting, you know, worse scores in that class. Maybe they withdraw or isolate from family and friends. Now you kind of see them more alone. Maybe they're avoiding things that remind them of the event. Um, or they might have these behavioral changes like we talked about, being disruptive, disrespectful, more tantrums, uh, showing more anger, resentment, sadness, or worry, just kind of more emotional. Or if you know they're of an age or they have exposure to things, maybe they're using substances or they're engaging in kind of riskier behavior to kind of escape. And then for adults, you know, again, stronger emotions. So maybe there's a lot more worrying than there was before. Maybe there's feeling anxious, feeling sad, being scared, crying more often, again, attention issues. It can happen where there's a lot of thoughts about the event or flashbacks if they experience the event or if they have an image of what the event looks like. Flashback is like, I'm here, you know, sitting in my living room and all of a sudden mentally I'm like back in the event, you know, and I'm feeling as if it's like happening again. Like maybe my body gets tense and I get anxious and I'm sweating, but I'm just sitting here in my living room, but mentally I've gone somewhere else. Um, having nightmares or issues sleeping a lot of times that's because of worries, or maybe it's just my body more tense, um, avoiding people or places that remind you of the event and also becoming isolated from friends and family. So as I'm reading these lists, you know, people, these aren't like fun things. I don't hear anyone going, oh, this sounds like a great time. Or, you know, the, these are signs that something is off. It's something's a little different, but what is expected? So if we think about it, I'm, let's say I live in a community where there was just a school shooting. What is expected? A reaction is expected. It would be a little more um, off or concerning if I was just fine and everything was great and this was just a usual day. You know, we're not robots. We do have feelings. We are affected by things. So it is absolutely normal to be affected by strong things that happen. Um, things that kind of make us question our safety, things that are unexpected, out of control. It is very normal to have a reaction. It's expected to have a reaction, actually. So the guideline is usually, if if it was a single event, let's say it was one time there was a tragedy. It's not like an ongoing, we're living in war. It was like a one-time violence event. Um, it's about a month of adjustment that's expected. So if there was a mass shooting, I might be experiencing some of these things for about a month or so. If it's gang violence and I live in a neighborhood where there's this one or a few gangs and I'm always kind of worried, it might last longer than a month. It might be an ongoing thing because it's an ongoing stress. So that's a little different. Um, but after like a strong one time event, it's usually a month. So that's you just want to keep your eye on it. Like, OK, my kid you know, is having these reactions. It's only been a week. Okay. Maybe I'm not going to worry as much, but I'm going to keep my eye on it because when the one month time hits, I want to go, okay, this isn't getting better. This is getting worse. And maybe I need to kind of escalate the situation. Maybe I need to do something other than what I've been doing. Maybe I go take them to see a therapist, see the doctor something like that. You absolutely do not have to wait a month. If it's been one week, and the next week is so much worse. Maybe my kid was just sad before and now my kid is drinking and my kid never drank before and they're not of an age where I'm okay with that. Maybe I'm not going to wait. Oh, let's wait two more weeks and see how this plays out. Maybe I'll take them to go talk to someone sooner. But just the one month is just something to keep in mind, like a loose guideline. I like this quote, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. So again, it would be super weird if, you know, and I don't mean to say weird, it would just be a little off, more concerning if something major happened and it's business as usual. And I, I don't even seem like anything happened. That might be a little more concerning. Maybe I'm not in touch with my feelings. Maybe I'm 
avoiding or I'm trying to pretend things are okay. What usually happens with that is that later on, there's like an explosion of emotion. Later on, I might have a bigger breakdown or I might have a stronger emotional reaction. Um, you know, and people process things differently too. But so just saying, if you're having one of these reactions that has been on a previous slide, it's normal, even though it's not pleasant, I don't like it, but you're processing something major that happened. Another, uh, this quote that I put that I like healing is not linear. So it doesn't happen in a straight, clean line where it's the beginning and it's the end and I'm progressing and, oh, it's, it's, you know, beautiful growth. A lot of times it's messy. It's complicated. I feel better one day. I think I'm okay. The next day is a nightmare. That's normal. It's, we go up and down again, over time, hopefully we're having more good days than before. You know, we want to just track, am I getting kind of over time better, over time worse? You know, is it less quote unquote bad days than before? Just things to think about. Okay. How to help youth cope. So this is a little complicated because it depends on what the event was. If I was affected by this event, it might be a lot harder to support, you know, my family because I'm also going through it. So this is maybe goals, goals to have in mind, but again, we don't live in a perfect world, so it might be harder based on the situation. But if we're able to reduce other stressors, so if it's my kid that was really affected by something that happened, um, maybe I want to make the home less stressful. Uh, maybe I always fight with my mom. Let's say we live with my mom and I always fight with my mom. Maybe for a little while, I'm going to try to just keep the house a little calmer, less fighting. Maybe um, I'm going to implement more relaxing stuff. Maybe now we're going to have coloring time together every day, or we're going to have play time together every day. Um, or I'm going to make sure, oh, your, your sibling is going to take you for a walk. I'm going to try to kind of change the routine or really strengthen a routine that, um, promotes, you know, being together, having fun, trying to be relaxed. A lot of times if I'm stressed doing relaxing stuff with my kid can actually help me. So like my kids coloring, maybe I'll color and that might, you know, give me some relief too. Um, allow kids to express their feelings. So if the kid is, Oh, I'm really, you know, again, kids don't usually say it like that. I'm really sad, but kids crying, they're having a tantrum. They're processing what happened. So let them process it. That's how they're getting it out. So it's not, Oh no, you're going to be okay. It's okay. Like stop, stop, stop. Let them kind of process it out. Um, but also don't force it. So if a kid isn't, you know, sh having a tantrum, showing all these signs that we talked about, don't try to force it out of them. Like if, if they're going through it, it's going to come out. Um, so don't sit there and be like, do you need to, <laughs> do we need to play and act out what happened? Don't force it. Notice the changes in their behavior or mood. It can be helpful to write stuff down. That's your choice. Um, depending on how old the kid is, they, if they find stuff that you've written down, their mood was, you know, feisty today. They might get a little upset, but if it's a younger kid, or if you can um, keep track of where these notes are, it might be helpful because do I remember what mood my kid was in two weeks ago? No, maybe I might notice they're more grumpy than usual, but you know, it's helpful to kind of track things sometimes, especially if I do end up taking my kid to the doctor or therapist, it's helpful to say, oh yeah, you know, the first week, this is how they were, you know, these things kept coming up. The more details, the better sometimes. Um, giving kids a sense of control by having them pick meals. Oh, what do you want for dinner? This thing or this thing, or, Oh, what, what play activity do you want to do right now? Um, or what clothes do you want to wear? Just giving them a little sense of control when this event happened that might've left them feeling completely out of control and in chaos can be helpful. Um, again, having the routines down and then if appropriate, inform and involve other people. So if my kid is having a really hard time at home coping with this, they're probably going to have a hard time at school, or maybe I want the teachers to just be aware. This is a mood that's coming up. Like, don't get my kid in trouble because they're having a tantrum. They just went through this huge thing. 
or, you know, maybe there can be a little more support and attention around the situation. Um, also I want the teachers or whoever to help me track this stuff. So is my kid, you know, wetting themselves at school, this might be stuff I need to eventually tell a therapist. So it can be helpful to just have everyone on the same page, keeping an eye out for these things. Again, this isn't in, in an ideal world where teachers are able to pay that much attention to the kids and some communities and some schools, there's so many kids and not enough teachers. If it was an event in the community, maybe the teachers are overwhelmed themselves and then the kids are all overwhelmed. But again, these are kind of ideal goals that we can strive towards. Um, and again, always keep in mind that you can get therapy or support services. Um, it's so, I didn't include more information on how to do that because it's so complicated with people's insurance these days, how to, how to get it done. So a lot of times it comes down to, unless you can pay out of pocket, um, a lot of times it comes down to calling your insurance and seeing what places they're going to cover or for your kids, you can take them to the regular doctor and say, oh, you know, I want a referral for therapy that can be helpful. So at some schools, there's school counselors. Um, so it's the resources are a little more complicated, but there's always ways to, to find out. And you can always ask your doctor and maybe they can help point you in the right direction. Setting boundaries. This is helpful for ourselves and also for us helping kids. So we talked on this last slide about reducing stressors and trying to create a more relaxing environment for the kid. What about for me? I'm going through this too. Maybe it was an event that affected me or just seeing my family, seeing my kids, seeing my neighbors affected is going to bring me stress. So what boundaries can I set to create a calmer environment for myself? So who are my calm, supportive people? You know, what should be in this environment? Um, and what things do I maybe need to take some distance from um, to just take care of myself a little bit? Uh, a lot of times this comes with limiting news exposure. So around elections, around tragic events, a lot of times there's a need to limit how much time I'm spending with the news because the news can be very upsetting. And you know, that's a fact. So it's a balance of, I wanna stay informed and at what cost? Like I need to take care of myself or being informed isn't gonna be helpful. Um, social media, I think of, you know, social media comments, fighting, 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 that might be something to limit if it's having a negative impact on you. Um, so, Let's say I go, no, I need to be informed. I can't uh, avoid the news. And so how can I do this? Okay, be intentional and plan when you're gonna watch the news. So if I need to be informed, let's say I set the boundary of I'm gonna get an hour of news time a day. Maybe that's even too much, but that's fine. Maybe I can plan, okay, I like this news time. I like this anchor, or I like this program, whatever. So maybe I can plan something before and something after that's relaxing so that the impact of what I see won't be as strong. Maybe I'll still get stressed out because again, I'm human and I'm not going to be comfortable with seeing these things, but maybe instead of my stress level going from, you know, instead of it being at a hundred percent, maybe it'll be at 90% because I did this relaxing stuff before. Maybe it'll be at 75. Who knows? Who knows the strength of of the relaxing stuff you can do, but at least it'll be less intense. And when the stress is really, really high, we don't think as clearly, we don't act as clearly. It causes other problems. Now I'm yelling at someone unrelatedly and I have to go fix that later, or I'm going to pretend it didn't happen. It causes other problems. So it's really for your benefit and it's for the benefit of other people. If you can really force yourself to do these relaxing things, um, a lot of times you don't want to, when we're stressed, we don't want to, I want to sit here on the couch and just think, 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 and become more stressed. I don't want to, but my body does it sometimes. So having something to really, I don't even get to think about it. It's not a question. It's I'm going to do this thing and then I'll watch the news. Um, 
so having something relaxing before and then something relaxing after that you're kind of forcing yourself to do, even if while you're doing it, you're not as into it, maybe the next day you'll wake up a little more relaxed. It's not often, it's not all the time immediate relaxation. And then limiting how much time is spent talking about what happened. If this stressful thing happened in the community, it's obviously on my mind. It's on my family's mind. It's in my emotions. It's taking up a lot of my day. Normal, you know, but now every phone call I get is going to be about it. And we're just repeating the same stuff. We're having the same arguments and I'm getting all riled up on the phone you know, maybe I still need social support. I need my friends. I need my family, but it's like, okay, let's just talk about this. Let's get it out. First 10 minutes of this conversation. Let's get it out. Oh, you know, this happened and I'm, you know, but then maybe the rest of the time we can talk about other stuff. So it's a balance that we need. We need to process it. We need support, but I can't be overthinking and obsessing about it because again, that's going to uh, paralyze me. That's not going to help me actually take any positive action. That's just overloading me and overwhelming me. As I'm saying this, I have to note, a lo- there's a lot of privilege with being able to take a step back. If I'm, you know, in a war torn country, I might not have the luxury of being like, let me not think about this. If there's bombs actively, you know, going off where I live. I can't be like, let me think about this later on and stop talking to me about this. So this is more for us that have a little more distance between the situation, um, which we're we're also really powerful as advocates, but I'm not going to be a powerful advocate if I'm so riled up that I'm just reacting to everything. So again, I I just note the the privilege that comes with being able to take this space. Um, And then there's a concept. I didn't um, include a lot about it because you can just Google it but it's called worry time. So if this is something on my mind all day, you know, it can be community violence. It can also be just anxiety. Maybe I'm really worried about my kids. One of them's making bad decisions. Oh, and you know, I can go all day. I can talk to everyone about it, but it's like, wow, I just can't stop thinking about it. There's this thing called worry time, which is, okay, I'm going to give myself half an hour a day or an hour a day. And this hour is going to be the time that I allow myself to freely think about this topic. The rest of the day, I try to focus on other things. So if it's, you know, my worry time is going to be at 530 at night and it's 12 lunchtime and I'm thinking of, oh, my kid and oh, their partner and oh, the stress. I go, no, no, no. You're thinking about it again that's for 5:30. So you really try to to um compartmentalize I guess or to to put that those thoughts to your worry time. You might go, oh, but you're just ignoring your problems or maybe you won't think of more solutions if you're not thinking about it so long. What the research shows is that's actually not true. A lot of times the more you think about something, you overthink, it becomes more stressful. Again, your concentration goes down you're not making as good of decisions. So a lot of times you do need that break of let me relax. And then maybe after I've thought of something else for a little bit, I'll come back to it and the solution will be there. Yeah. I can think of a million times that's happened to me, like with something in the house, I'm like really struggling to do something. And then I walk away and I come back and it's like, Oh, duh, that's how you do it. Or you're struggling with it for hours and someone comes by and they're like, you didn't see this. And you're like, Oh my gosh, I've been so overthinking it. So that's kind of the concept about it. Again, it comes with a lot of privilege being able to compartmentalize into an hour. But even if we're more in the midst of the conflict or the stress, the idea is to take a break from the the thinking about it and to take care of yourself for a little bit. So it can be challenging, but there's little ways that we can all do that a little bit more. Um, And then trying to stay engaged with things that bring joy. So, you know, again, it's a balance of, oh, my schedule's so busy and this really stressful thing happened and I can't maintain the same rhythm. Like I need to take care of myself. So, okay, maybe I'll cancel a few commitments. I'll skip a few, you know, engagements. 
to take care of myself. Okay. That's okay. But if I'm just, I'm canceling everything that might be more like, Oh, I'm isolating. Um, and that might actually lead to me having like a worse mood. So it is a, a little balance and maybe take some, some thinking and some talking, talking it out with a friend or a family member, or again, it can be a professional. So mindfulness, so bringing in mindfulness. So mindfulness and meditation does have roots in other cultures and religions that I'm not a part of, that a lot of people are not a part of. I mentioned that just to, you know, acknowledge it and recognize it. The way it's used in more recent times is kind of like a, uh, how do I say this? Like a watered down version. Like they took out all the religious words. They took out all the cultural stuff. And now it's just kind of a breathing practice. So most religions, most people are able to still do mindfulness or meditation because, you know, me focusing on my breath is different than me chanting in a different language, something that might contradict my religion. So I'm just saying that, that if you've been kind of turned off to mindfulness because you think it contradicts your religious or cultural beliefs, maybe explore it more, maybe talk to your religious leader. There might be some more understanding that can be um, met there, or maybe it's not right for you, which is also fine. You're in control of your own choices. Um, But how we can define it in a non-religious or cultural term is kind of like a cognitive mental practice. So it's intentional it's like purposeful. It's recurrent. I'm doing it over and over again, directing my attention to the current moment. So I'm here sitting with you and I'm focused on this zoom. I'm focused on the phone that I'm holding that has the zoom focused on my computer that has the PowerPoint. I can see, Oh, I'm in my, I mean, I am in my living room. Here's my plants. Here's the light. I hear a car passing by. This is me in this current moment. The difference is me sitting here in my living room going, wow, this thing that happened earlier today really upsets me. I can't believe this person said this to me. What are my kids doing? What's happening here? What's going to happen? It's like, that's a lot different. In the second example, I'm not connected to this moment. I'm connected with the past. I'm connected to a future that might not happen. I'm just a lot more in my head versus in this moment. Um, it's supposed to be non-judgmental. So let's say I am here sitting with you being mindful in this moment. And I do get a thought of what is my kid doing right now? They're really worrying me. I don't go, Oh, you're so ridiculous for thinking that you're, you keep worrying. You're not supposed to be worrying. You're so annoying. You're not doing this mindfulness thing, right? It's not supposed to be judgmental. It's like, okay, things are popping up because things pop up, but let me bring my attention back. Let me Again, focus on the rustling of the tree, the PowerPoint. So you're not supposed to kind of beat yourself up about it. You're just supposed to keep trying to come back to the present moment. And you're not supposed to overthink or get into too much detail about whatever comes up. Like if I have the thought, oh, what are my kids doing? You know, I can go, oh, I had that thought. Let me, let me focus again on the Zoom. Instead of going, what are they doing? What, what's happening here? And now it's been 10 minutes and I'm over there thinking about it. Um, or if it's like, oh, I noticed a car. I heard a car driving by. It's like, okay, I noticed the car driving by. But even then I'm not going to go, I wonder what type of car it is. What, what's oh, gas prices? Now it's like I, I'm letting my mind kind of run loose instead of just noticing what's happening and bringing my attention back to what I'm doing. So I like this little graphic. It says mindful, like, is my mind full of stuff or am I being mindful? So in the mind where my mind is full of stuff, the image shows a person, they're outside, there's trees around, there's the sun, but in their head, they're thinking of the gas prices. That's what I'm thinking of. They're thinking of their family. They're thinking of work. They're thinking of their health. They're thinking of so much stuff. It's like, they're not even connected to the trees or the sun outside. They're just thinking of all these things. And then the other person walking right next to them in the image, they're focused on the trees. They're focused on the sun. They're focused on that present moment, not what's kind of in their head or what comes up for them. So again, in those two examples, 
the person focused on the trees, they might have had all these thoughts pop up. Oh, gas prices. Oh, my to do list. But they can bring their attention back to the trees, back to the sun. So again, it's not like, oh, things keep popping in my head. I'm not good at this or I'm not doing it right. It's like, no, your brain is busy. Your brain is used to going a million miles a minute. It is absolutely normal that it's going to try to keep going, but you still have power to bring your attention back, even though sometimes it's hard. It'll get easier the more, the more you do it. And it's easier to do it in less stressful situations like me today on a regular day. It can be easier to practice mindfulness than if I'm really stressed out. It's going to be the first time I try mindfulness when you're really stressed out. Isn't the time to like learn new things. That's the time we kind of go back to our comfort stuff. So I, I say that as a plug of like, try it on a regular day, not just when you're stressed. And then maybe it'll work better when you're stressed. Okay. So research on mindfulness, people who have higher levels of mindfulness um, they engage in practice more regularly. And then sometimes the practice will just become natural. So I don't even have to think, let me focus on my breath. I'll just be naturally doing it. Sometimes those people that have these higher practice and higher levels of natural mindfulness end up having less stress, lower negative mood state. So my mood is better. My physical health will be better and my relationships will be closer. Um, so again, None of this said your life, you just won't have any stress come up. You know, you will be spared of all stress. No, it's just, I'm, I'm handling it a little differently. It's affecting me a little differently. Mindfulness practice can improve your memory, make you less like neurotic, um, can increase positive emotions. And then it can help with concentration, with insight. Um, the way you think about things, it promotes better regulation of your emotions. If you, you know, get anxious, you get angry outbursts, you get crying outbursts, you know, whatever, however your emotions come out, everyone has a way that their stress comes out, whatever it is, it'll go a little better through mindfulness. It can help regulate your attention. If your attention's kind of all over the place, it can increase your self-awareness. So a more realistic view of myself. Um, and it can help with perspective taking. So perspective taking is when I can see the other person's side of things. I can see more than just my beliefs, which again, that makes sense. Why my relationships might be closer, why my stress might be less instead of going, Oh, you know, people are just terrible and blah, blah, blah. I might go, huh? I wonder why they're, why would that person cut me off driving? Oh, maybe they were late themselves. Oh, okay. Maybe I just saved myself a road rage, you know, in this process. So perspective taking can be helpful and it usually leads to more solutions versus like the opposite of perspective taking is <laughs> I'm sure you can relate, or maybe you've seen it like people that were arguing on social media and they're not really trying to understand your side of things. They're just really trying to assert their beliefs over and over again. Maybe they'll even send you articles but they're not like really reading the ones that you send them or they're, they're reading it just to argue with it. Like they're really not trying to see your side of things and that that's not really helpful. So again, less stress, better mood, better relationships. So I'm going to go over some strategies today that you can join me with if you would like. So different ways that we can use mindfulness to cope. Again, we are using mindfulness to relax ourselves, to get us functioning at a more adaptive level. Mindfulness isn't going to fix the fact that there was just a shooting at my school. Like some stuff, some other stuff needs to happen. Me relaxing can't be the end of that story. Like that's not, you know, but this will at least help me kind of get regulated uh, feeling a little better, then maybe I can do something more proactive. Um, and for people that just went through the big stress, this can be really important, you know, getting out of the, the stress state. So belly breathing is like a big first step. So when we're stressed, a lot of times we breathe from the chest where it's better for our body. It's more relaxing if we breathe from our stomachs. So 
And I'm sure maybe some of you can relate to a time maybe you've been crying and you hear, <laughs> or you see in kids, maybe they're really breathing hard and it seems like it's more from their chest. So that's usually a sign that the breath is not getting into the stomach and that can make it harder to breathe. It's a sign of stress. So, and some people naturally breathe that way. Unfortunately, they naturally breathe from the chest and it takes a little effort to breathe from the stomach. But it's again, the more you practice it, the easier it is. One day you won't be thinking about it and you'll naturally be breathing a little more relaxingly or comfortably. But to do belly breathing, first, let's figure out if you breathe from the chest or the belly more. So put one hand on the chest, one hand on the belly. Take a deep breath in and tell me what moves more. Let's say you're like, okay, my chest, my, I don't even really feel my belly. Okay. So what you can do is you can lace your fingers and now you're going to put them both on your belly. And now when you take your deep breath in and out, you're really trying to get movement in your stomach. So maybe when you take your deep breath in, you know, your stomach inflates or your body inflates with the air. Maybe you're really pushing your stomach out. Oh, like it's, you just ate a huge meal and you're can't, you know, button your pants anymore. Or like you're pregnant or something. You're just gonna really puff out your stomach. Ooh. And now when you're breathing in, you're releasing that air. You naturally kind of like suck in, maybe you're going to suck in a little harder, you know, to really get the, the difference and the movement in your stomach. So you're really going to try to breathe from the stomach, you know, breaths as slowly as you can. That's comfortable. Something that we know through research is that a longer exhale is actually more relaxing. So if you can, you know, breathe in, belly goes out. And then when you exhale, try to just a little slower, a little longer, like you're blowing out birthday candles, either with your nose or your mouth, but really just trying to lengthen that. So you could just try belly breathing. Maybe my goal is going to be five minutes of belly breathing, or I'm going to try to get to 20 breaths. And then the next day, 30, you know, whatever the goal might be. If you're feeling like you breathe more from the chest, belly breathing is going to be your first stop because it's going to make everything easier once you're breathing from your belly. The second one, it could also be a, you with your hands on your belly, but they're conscious breaths. So conscious breaths is I'm at the grocery store and a worry pops into my head or the cashier is really stressing me out. They're all over the place. I'm going to just stop focusing on this cashier for a second. I could still be looking at them and listening, but I'm going to check in with my breath. So I'm looking, I'm listening to this cashier all over the place, but I'm going to go, let me just take an inhale and an exhale. I'm going to focus on my breath so I can be focusing on the noise that it makes. I can be focusing on how my body's moving, whatever it is. I'm just focusing more on my breath. You can do that pretty discreetly. I can do this while I'm waiting at a doctor's appointment. I can most of the times do it when I'm talking to someone, maybe they might notice, Oh, like, are you okay? You might go, Oh, it's just, I needed a, a moment, but a lot of times they don't notice. You can just, Oh, okay. And still be talking. So again, that's something you can do at any time. Helpful to do it when you're not stressed out, then maybe it'll pop into your head when you are stressed out. A five senses exercise is really good if you're a little more stressed out than these other situations. Maybe I'm feeling a little panicky. Maybe I'm like, God, oh, getting dizzy. It's just, I'm stressed out. So what it is, is you know your five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch. What's the other one? Sound. There we go. So you name five things that you're picking up on with each of those senses. So, and you want it to be in different parts of the room that you're in. You're not going to focus on one area because then you're not really connected with the present moment. You're just kind of connected to this left side of the room. So if it's five things I see, I'm going to go, okay, I see this plant, the, and then describe it a little bit. The leaves are green. 
the tip of that leaf is brown. I need to, you know, trim it. Oh, okay. The plant is opening like this. It's tall like this. Oh, okay. The next thing. Oh, that pillow, that pillow is, you know, this pattern, it's this color, it's whatever. Okay. The pillow. Oh, my leg, my leg is, you know, looks like this, you know, whatever it is, five things, smell, five things I smell. Mm, this one can be a little harder because sometimes you don't smell five things, but I can also, I can go, oh, I smell my coffee from earlier. I smell my breath. Woo. That was the onion I had in my salad at lunch. I can smell myself. Woo. You know, I need to put on deodorant. Or if there's not five smells, I can go, I can pick something up. I go, let me smell this smoothie. This smoothie smells like kale. That was just a side note, me drinking it. Um, you know, you can also find tools. I can smell my chapstick. I can smell perfume. You can kind of get five different things to smell. Taste is another one where maybe there's not going to be five. Um, but you can try to taste. Okay. I can just taste my mouth right now. Mm, my mouth is dry. It tastes like that onion from lunch or it tastes like that smoothie that I just had, or oh, it just tastes dry. You know, maybe if I have a water, I can go, mm, let me check in with this taste. You know, if I have a cough drop, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can find five things to taste. Um, touch is usually one you can find five things. You're going to go around the room, wherever you are, and touch five different things. And again, try to describe it. I'm touching this couch. It's smooth. Um, it's a little cold. Um, oh, I'm going to touch my leg. You know, my leg feels a little rough. Um, I feel this mole I have right here. Oh, I'm going to touch the wall. The wall is smooth. You know, whatever it is, touching five different things. Um, and then sound. You know, I'm going to listen for five different things. Oh, okay, I hear the tree moving. I hear some traffic. I hear people in the room next door. You know, five different things you hear. Um, there's a longer practice that can be really helpful it's not usually something you're going to do outside. It might be something you do before bed or in the morning, or you can do little shorter versions of it, like on the go. But these other practices are like on the go. I can do five senses anywhere, pretty much. I can take a conscious breath truly anywhere. This progressive muscle relaxation is like a seated practice. I need to be sitting and a few minutes to dedicate to it. There are a bunch of YouTubes. If you YouTube progressive muscle relaxation, you will find an endless amount of YouTubes that you can click, different styles, different teachers, see what you like. But progressive muscle relaxation, oops, we're over here. It's effective for chronic pain, like, oh, I have back pain, oh, I have, you know, arthritis, whatever it is. It's helpful for in insomnia if I have sleep issues. It's actually one of the practices they teach when they treat people for sleep disorders a lot of the times. It can be helpful for anxiety. I didn't include it, I should have, but it's also been studied with depression. It's been studied with a lot of things. There's a lot of research on progressive muscle relaxation. But what it is, is this is how I think of it. You'll find different YouTubes on it and you might find different uh, meditation scripts. But you take five breaths, you tense a muscle for 10 seconds, you release the muscle, you take five more breaths. So I think of it like a sandwich, five, 10, five. You start with your head, you end up at your feet. And here on the right side of the screen are the different uh, body parts. So let's see what the time is. And we have a little time. I did make this uh, presentation training a little longer because I knew we were gonna do some of these practices. So I won't go over every, uh, we won't do the full practice, but I'll, we'll get, get a little taste for this. So we're going to take five breaths. Okay. Go at your own pace. I'll go at my own pace. I don't want to count and I'm going too fast or too slow, but again, inhaling, hopefully a longer exhale, and you can put your hand on your belly if you want to or need to. So five breaths. You don't have to close your eyes if you're not comfortable, but if you don't just make sure you're looking at something that's not super interesting, that's not going to distract you a lot.
oh, I was taking a breath and I heard this car go by. What do I do? I go, oh, that was fine. I noticed the car and I'm going to keep going. I was on breath four. So I'm going to keep going. Okay, for me, that was five. Again, normal to be distracted, normal to notice things. If there's a fire and the fire alarm is going off, I do not want to be sitting here meditating while the house is on fire. I need to hear it, but you get to decide, oh, that was just a car driving by. I don't need to pay attention to it. It's not an emergency. So let's go back to the breath. Anyways, so we did the five breaths and then we're going to tense a body part for 10 seconds. So the first one is the head and neck. If you have neck problems, you had a surgery, you know your body better than I do. I can't even see you, right? So be gentle with yourself. If you can't tense this area, let's say I have a real bad neck, I'm not even going to mess with it. You can imagine the way the muscles feel when you do tense it, or you can just do it very lightly. It's up to you. But if you're able to, this is how you would do it. For the head and neck, you're going to look up. I'm looking up at the ceiling. If you could see the back of my neck, it feels like it's wrinkly. It's all squished together. And it almost feels like I'm putting my head on my upper back. So I'm like that. I'm squeezing for 10 seconds. It's already been like a good three or four. So it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. In that time, I was just tightening. I wasn't pulsing. I was just keeping it tight. Then deep breath in. When you exhale, let it go. You could give it a stretch if you want. It's up to you. Oh, my neck popped. That's totally fine. And then you would go again with your five breaths. So we'll do five breaths. That was five for me. Let's say it was five for you too. The next one is my shoulders. So for this one, I take my shoulders up to my earlobes. Like I'm trying to get them to touch. Maybe they do touch. I don't know, but you're squeezing up. I feel my shoulders touching my neck. You know, I'm squeezing up and I'm holding it like that for the 10 seconds. So again, a few already went by because I'm a talkative lady. So we'll say I'm at five already, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, inhale. As you exhale, you drop the shoulders. Woo. You can stretch again if you want, do whatever. And then you would take the five breaths again. So we're not gonna go through all of it, but I will go over the body parts just so you can see what I'm talking about. Again, if you look it up on YouTube, it's a lot of times it's different. Sometimes they include the face. This is my version, the way that I teach it. Um, so you'll have this recording and you'll have this slide. I'll send the, the PowerPoint after our meeting today, after we hang up. Um, but again, YouTube's, they have something different. It's helpful to learn how to do this without YouTube because there's going to be a day that I'm stressed and my phone's dead. There's going to be a day that my phone is broken and maybe that's why I'm stressed, you know, or Maybe I'm not at home. I am at the park, but I have a few moments and my body's feeling a little tense. I want to do this. So it's helpful to learn how to do it on your own, but you of course have resources. Um, so the next one would be the arms in the back. So for this one, hands and fists, hold your arms. So my arm is like this, right? I'm going to stick my chest out. And as I stick my chest out, my arms are going to go back. So now I'm like little chicken wings over here. My chest is out and I'm tightening my upper back. Like I'm trying to get my shoulder blades to touch. So I'm squeezing a lot of different things. My fists, my arms, my chest is out. My back is squeezed. So like this, again, I keep talking too much. So let's say four seconds passed. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I'll inhale. 
exhale, let it go. You know, maybe I want to stretch my little fingers a little bit. Maybe my arms get a good stretch in there, whatever you want. I would do my five more breaths, then come back to the body. So the next one you close, you won't be able to see me on the camera, but you're sitting like usual, you know, you're your um, knees are bent. Usually, you know, your thighs are like this and then your, your legs are like this, your feet are on the floor. So you're going to close your thighs, close your legs. You're going to imagine you have a coin and you're putting it in between your knees and you don't want it to fall. So you're squeezing your legs closed, more so squeezing your thighs. And then you hold it like that for 10 seconds. You inhale, you let it go. You open your legs, you stretch. The next one, for those that are able uh, to move their feet and legs, this next one, you're gonna straighten your legs out. So I'm still sitting. I'm gonna straighten my legs out. I'm gonna lift my feet up off the floor an inch, you know, even less, if I'm comfortable with that. And then I'm gonna point my toes up at the sky. So I'm pointing my toes towards my shin, towards my knee, pointing my feet up. So you feel that stretch behind the calf. Don't stretch too hard that you're giving yourself a cramp because I can't help you from over here, but you want to feel that little tightness. So you would hold that the 10 seconds, inhale, let it go. Finish with your five breaths. And I always like to finish by repeating one area. So, oh, where did I feel like, oh, that felt the best or that really needed it. Um, oh, maybe it was my shoulders. Okay. I'm going to do my shoulders again. And I'm going to try to go a little slower because it's the last one, you know, squeezing and then the breaths and then I'm done. So I know it's, um, might be a little harder because we're not going over the whole practice together, but hopefully this is enough that you feel like you can do this on your own. And then, like I said, YouTube progressive muscle relaxation, you could even Google how to do progressive muscle relaxation and it'll come up with like a PDF or a website if you want to teach yourself how to do it too. And, and if this wasn't enough, uh, to do that. Okay. So we're talking about mindfulness. So you can also engage in mindfulness while you're doing pretty much anything, right? Cause it's just focusing on the present moment, but there's a lot of activities that people do mindfully. So there's mindful walking. What that is, is walking slowly. And I'm going to notice every part of my feet touching the floor. I'm going to notice when my heel is on the floor. Oh, then the middle of my foot. Oh, then my toes. I'm going to notice what the ground feels like that I'm walking on. If I'm barefoot, I can notice more things. If I have my shoes on, I can still notice a lot of things. Um, and you're just really paying attention to how your body moves and the ground. So usually you're doing it slowly. I can do mindful eating. So this is really good for people that like, oh, I stress eat and I overeat um, or I have weight loss goals. Mindful eating can be helpful because it gives you some time to recognize your body's full, but I can mindfully drink this smoothie. So I'm going to slowly notice how the smoothie smells. Mm, okay. Take a sip, take a slow sip, really notice the texture, notice how it tastes notice the temperature in my mouth. Like you just notice everything that you can about it. Um, you can try this with kids, like, Oh, give them a mint. And really, we're going to try to like, uh, eat this mint as slowly as we can. You really want it to last in your mouth. So you're not going to chew it and you're just going to notice it. You know, you can do this with pretty much anything. And then, like we said, mindfulness can just be observing. I can just be sitting outside and the goal is going to be not in my thoughts. It's going to be in connecting to the moment. So I'm outside. I'm going to notice the temperature. You can think of your five senses, right? You're just noticing everything with those five senses. So I'm going to notice the sun or the wind on my skin. I'm going to hear the tree. I'm going to hear the birds. I'm going to hear the traffic. I'm going to smell whatever it smells like outside. You know, I'm really kind of tuning into this present moment and noticing all I can notice about it, the color of the sky, the shape of the leaves. Like there's so many details. There's 
and, and then this is just looking in one area. I can look this way and there's so many other details. So you're really just noticing the present moment. Okay, so because we did talk a little bit about how to support kids, I did include, you wouldn't, a kid can do some progressive muscle relaxation, maybe not as long, but they can, oh, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Okay, let it go. Woo, let's take some breaths. They can do that. Um, but there's also different exercises that are more fun for them to do. So an easy one is counting your fingers. I don't know if that's like the way to say it, but you put your hand out and you're going to go, you trace your fingers. Maybe is a better way to say it. As you go up the finger, you inhale, you go down, you exhale. So, whew, and you can do this with the kids and you can teach them to do it themselves. A really good thing to do with kids is to have them do these things. I mean, always, but if you're on timeout, timeout is full of feelings. And I'm telling you, don't do this. You know, you just kicked your sibling or you kicked your friend. Don't do that. And the kid might be tantrummy. And now I go, just go sit there. I'm not really helping the kid deal with the feelings, even though it was a tantrum, the kid shouldn't have been aggressive. They were quote unquote wrong, whatever it is. But like the kid is full of these like feelings and frustrations. And I'm just telling them to go sit in the corner. So a lot of times to help them calm down, to give them that perspective, depending on what age they are at some ages, the perspective isn't there yet, but I can go, okay, you're going to take your 10 breaths and then you're going to go on timeout or we're going to do the 10 breaths together. And then you're going to go on timeout and it might actually help them calm down a little bit. And then maybe they'll start doing that on their own when they're frustrated, they'll just kind of take breaths and they'll, they'll regulate themselves. So that can be really helpful. Um, so that can be, you know, counting with the fingers. It can be take 10 breaths and count out loud. You know, you finish one, say one, you know, whatever it is. You can do five senses with kids, but usually you have to um, prompt them unless they're of an age where maybe they can write down what they're noticing. Um, you can do the mindful walking and mindful all these things with the kids. Usually having, usually that's a little more boring for them. So usually focusing on something can be helpful. How many birds can we notice? What color are the birds? Oh, oh, then there's a crow there. You know, that can be fun. Or what color cars? Let's focus on the cars. Oh, blue car, you know, red car, you know. That can be fun. And then there's different, of course, an endless amount of activities on YouTube. If you're really wanting the kid to learn this, then usually just setting them up with the YouTube and going, watch this. Usually it's helpful if you do it with them the first time at least. Um, or if it's like one of these counting the fingers that you can get them started and then they can do it on their own. Okay. And then another tip for, you know, where this presentation, we're talking a lot about um, just how to calm down, like how to cope, how to feel more um, regular after a stressful event. But we're not talking about some of the important stuff, which is like advocacy, right? Like there's this community violence. There was a mass shooting. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk about relaxing and my family, like how selfish, like I said, it's not really selfish because we need to take care of ourselves um, before we can take care of, you know, anyone else or hurt. a lot of times I need to get regulated before I can even think clearly. Um, but after you've regulated yourself, after you're feeling a little more able, there's things to do, you know, about community violence. So educating yourself through credible sources. Um, you can volunteer for agencies that you more or less trust that are doing the work already. Like me, you know, tackling a major issue by myself is overwhelming. So it's like, why not just join in to this agency that's already doing this? And let's say I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. I can't go counsel youth, gang youth. Like maybe that's too much for me. All these volunteer agencies always need people to help with administrative stuff, printing, cutting stuff, flyers, brainstorming, whatever your abilities are. A lot of times an agency has a use for you. Um, so don't be like, oh, because I can't, you know, go 
to the city where the shooting was and go help the kids and go do this. Like I can't do anything. No, you can still contribute in some ways. And if you're able to, you can always donate. Um, so those are just some simple things. There's, you know, a lot more things that people can do to advocate, but this was just like a list of simple things. And again, this, the advocacy wasn't as much the point of the training. It was more the kind of getting yourself feeling, um, a little better to be able to think of what the next steps that you want to take are. So this is the presentation I have. I do have, this is some of the sites that I referenced. I have some other references to that are more of like the research, but all these links you can click on and they'll have um, information that you can, you know, look at if you want more information on how to cope with some of these things. And that is all I have for you all today. First question is, well, how did you come up with this idea? And um, on CHRC's part, I think that um, people have put into our feedback forms the growing concern about how much stress it is to sort of just digest every day or watching the news. And, and I think that is why that's the inspiration for this topic. And what I'll add to it is I brought in the mindfulness side of things because there's so much research on mindfulness and how it is effective with stress, how it's effective with trauma, if it's, you know, a really strong event. Um, and a lot of times mindfulness is used in like disaster situations to kind of get everyone out of like crisis, um, a little quicker. So mindfulness is something you can do on your own. You don't need to join a group that can be helpful and fun, but you can do it on your own. You don't need a special room or a special chair or a special music. Like you're really in control of your breath and noticing different things. So it's, it can be pretty powerful. Um, it, it can be frustrating for people sometimes when they're just starting. Um, but the more you do it, the more you're kind of able to go, okay, that's just the frustration. Again, don't pay attention to that. Focus on my breath. Then it'll get a little easier and be a little more powerful. Yeah. Um, the, the next question we have, how can I stop worrying about what I can do to help? Um, maybe this person meant can't do to help. Um, I copy and pasted these questions and sometimes I might not catch the typos. That's okay. Um, so worry time might be, again, oh, it, worrying is normal. It's if something is a big deal, if, you know, if something's kind of emotional, it's very normal to worry, but you're right. You don't want to spend all day worrying. It's affecting your living of your regular life. So the worry time might be something for you when you notice you're worrying, focusing on your breath instead might be something for you. And again, the point isn't, let me just focus on myself while the world is in crisis, but maybe if I'm feeling a little better, stronger, I can think of how I can actually help. And again, I'm not going to change, you know, I'm not going to stop gun violence. I, it's a little unrealistic to think one person is going to cause, you know, there's a lot of things that would need to change, but maybe I can make a contribution to the cause. Um, and I might not be able to even brainstorm how to do that if I'm in this worried, higher stress state. So it might just be like a nice little stepping stone to, to get a little relaxation in. And then when my brain's working a little better, I can think of what to do. Sounds good. I wrote that um, answer as a recommendation to this question. Um, does community trauma affect children more than adults and seniors? I'm not sure on the research for that. Um, what I know from my personal experience is it just affects people differently. Kids are at a very critical development point. Um, and kids are just forming habits. So whatever their reality is might continue. So you might see it as a little more delicate or sensitive that kids are being affected, but no adults can develop PTSD. Older adults can develop, you know, anxiety, PTSD. So everyone is pretty affected. Everyone needs support. Um, but yeah, I, there might be research about that too, but I, overall, it's not like, let's just focus on the kids or, you know, 
like if I'm a parent, let me just get my kids okay. And then I can worry about myself later. Everyone is going to be affected by a stressful event. Mm. But how to cope with depression and hopelessness due to current events. And, and you know, I think that this was uh, the whole focus of your presentation, but if you'd like to summarize it up in a yeah. way that might just leave an impression with this person. So a lot of times depression is, comes with like a lot of negative or sad thoughts, like hopelessness is definitely one of them. It's like, what can I do? I'm powerless. Again, that's not being in the present moment. If I'm so focused on my thoughts, on what's happened, what hasn't happened, what could happen, what I've done, what I haven't done, I'm not in the present moment. So a very simple answer would be more mindfulness, mm. but it depends on how strong the depression is. How long has it been going on? Could I benefit from medication? Maybe I don't like that. Maybe I'll try therapy. Maybe I don't like therapy. Maybe I can do a class or a group. Like there's a lot of options or an app or something. I don't know a lot about the apps, but there's a lot of options. So if, you know, just getting a little healthier with my eating, my exercise and doing mindfulness isn't enough, then maybe what's the next level up that I can do to, to kind of help these depressed thoughts, or maybe it's those things could be powerful, but I can't focus enough on it. So maybe I just need some support for a little bit through therapy, through medication, through a group, through whatever it is. And then I'll handle it on my own after. So different options. Thank you. Um, this next one is, I feel, I feel it. My friends feel it. My neighbors feel it. Collective trauma touches all of us. But why is it so hard to bring it up in order to support one another? It's always, that's too depressing. Let's talk about something else. Yeah. So it's, it's like I said, there needs, or it's helpful to have a balance of, okay, you know, we can talk about it, but it won't be the focus. But you also have to know who your people are. There are some people that talking about certain topics is not going to be helpful. Either they don't want to talk about it or it's too painful for them. Whatever it is, it's like, okay, I can't force you to talk about it. So maybe I can, you can be a part of my other relaxation. We talk about other stuff. We go on walks and maybe these are my people that I know are more of my emotional support people. Um, I think that's a really important point because um, crafting your support system is also something you can't just um, do with anybody because yeah. you're right. Not everyone is going to be perfect or helpful to be tough to talk to you about certain things. Yeah. And it's so good for you to think about yourself. There are going to be some times when it's not going to be helpful for you to really talk. Like maybe I had my worry time. I already watched the news today. I've already talked to a few people about this and I'm at my limit. If I'm at my limit and I tell my friend and they go, why can't you handle it? It's like, this isn't going to be helpful. Like I, this has to be my limit. Maybe I can talk to you about it later or maybe I can't handle it right now. So it's, it is a little balance, but you know, at least the person's telling you that maybe they're not the one to go to for that. It could be that they're at their limit. They're protecting themselves and their stress. It could be that they're avoiding. I don't really know, but either way, they're telling you not to bring it up. So it's kind of up to you what you want to do after that. If you want to keep bringing it up with them or you want to kind of respect them, bring it up with other people. It's, it's you. Thank you for that. Um, we have three more questions left, making great time. Um, this next question I, I feel small when big tragic things happen, What can I do to feel more productive towards the issue? And, and I think that you did answer this, but um, perhaps just a little bit of a repeat might also help. So you've done something important, which is you're recognizing a pattern in what comes up for you. When there are these big things, one of my default reactions is feeling small. So even that's powerful because you can go, oh, I'm, I'm feeling small. It's because this happened. It doesn't mean I am small. It doesn't mean I can't do anything. This is a common reaction. Let me do mindfulness. Let me feel a little more regular, strong, and then I can see how I can contribute. Again, one person can't change everything with a lot of situations, but you can make a meaningful contribution. Again, even if it's just helping 
an agency that is already doing work get by with their day-to-day, like helping them with administrative stuff, helping them volunteering. That's even important. Um, so yeah, so same answer, basically mindfulness until you're feeling at a level enough to take action and then figuring out what action you want. But the fact that you can recognize your patterns is helpful. Like someone else can say, Oh, I usually get really angry when these things come up and that's all really important information. Great. Um, second to last question. I hear people say privilege. What does that even mean? I feel like it's overused. Um, yeah, so I can, I, can, I can relate to that because it's something that's getting more and more attention now, even though it's always existed. But let's say a privilege is um, I'm from a community where not a lot happens. There's not a lot of gang violence. Like maybe I live in a richer neighborhood. Um, I'm not worried about walking out my house and having a gang shooting. I'm not worried about my kids going to school and being kidnapped or something like that. So that's a a privilege um, is that I don't have that worry just by existing. Some people go, how is that a privilege? I've worked very hard in my life to be able to afford living in this nice house. No one is saying you haven't. What they're saying is because of where you live, you're not as worried about these other things that other people are, you know? So I guess that's where the privilege comes in. Things that we know come with privilege. A lot of times your cultural background can come with privilege. Certain religions are seen differently than other ones. Um, You know, I think, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I Maybe from your examples, I hear it that like maybe privileges are the things you don't have to think about. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is definitely a part of it. Like, like I'm saying, if, if the tragedies happen, like privilege for me right now is that I'm not living in a place where there's an active war going on. I have the ability to go to work and feel more or less safe, go home, feel more or less safe. Like that is a privilege. And it's not something I had to work for. Like I was born into this situation more or less, or maybe I did work to get out of a neighborhood, but the working isn't the issue. The issue is that I'm getting some benefit just by existing. Yeah. Uh, here's a quick, here's another example. If you think of I don't know. If you think of the, the movie Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts, Julia Roberts goes into the store And she looks a certain way. She looks like she doesn't have money. Like she can't afford all the things in the store and the service people don't pay attention to her. They don't want to help her because you don't look like you can spend money here. That is a privilege. She didn't do anything, but walk into a store. Someone else that has more money walks into that store, gets more attention. So again, that person can go, yeah, but I worked my whole life. I have this job. That's totally fine. It doesn't mean you should be treated better just because you walk into a store and you look a certain way. So I, that's a, an example of privilege. There's a lot of, um, there's a, so much information about privilege online if, if that's not making sense. Um, you, you know, I, I think maybe perhaps a, um, a, a less, less monumental example is, I think my, well, my partner and I are, talk about it all the time. He's left-handed, I'm right-handed, and he always says the world was made for you. Mm-hmm. Yes, in lecture halls, um, sometimes like one-handed gloves or scissors. I, I've never really thought of scissors being left or right-handed, but they are. Um, are that's just... Uh... A like luxury you get automatically without having to think about it, without really working for it. It's just like, oh, all these scissors were kind of made for me where, yeah, this other person special store, they have to do all this and that just to kind of do the same thing, which is like cut paper in this example. So that's a good one. Uh, Well, we have our last question here, um, and it's about the strategies that you shared with the work for everyone, as long as they are doing the strategies right. Um. Will they work for everyone? It's, it's tricky. So these strategies have been studied with so many different people in so many different settings, like progressive muscle relaxation people in prisons can do it, you know? So 
they can work for everyone, but sometimes it's not their style. Like maybe my stress relief is exercise and I don't really even like this mindfulness stuff. It's like, that's fine. As long as like you can think of how, okay, well, when I'm stressed in the moment, how am I going to exercise? Okay. Maybe I need more strategies. Um, but it is a thing that people that are just starting mindfulness, or maybe you already like have attention challenges. It can be a little more frustrating, but everyone can get to a point where if you practice enough, it'll get a little easier. Um, it's just about sticking with it and being kind with yourself, like being gentle with yourself. If I'm having a lot of, I have attention issues, I'm getting distracted a lot. It's like, yeah, I have attention issues, but I can keep going and it'll get a little better. That was really great. Kind of like sports or reading, like whatever it is, the more effort you put into it, the easier it gets. So it could be helpful, but there's a lot of other things that could be helpful too for stress reduction. Yeah. And, and it sounds like these strategies, you know, just they, they take a time, they take a little time and you, you need to keep trying them. Um, maybe a couple of times it won't quite necessarily stick with you. Um, I know that I, mindfulness has been something I have tried to really learn over and over time, or really just being able to sit still with my thoughts and senses. I get mm-hmm. pretty fidgety and I just constantly think that um, mindfulness is really hard. But um, it's not some, I think maybe the place where I work, Community Health Resource Center, where we provide mental health services that it's in my life, it's constantly influencing me and I want to keep at it and I want to keep trying. And I know that not everyone will have that kind of reminder, but I think that there is, there is benefit in keeping at it. Um, Something where not every mindfulness exercise is going to be your jam. Like maybe I have too many distractions when you just sit there and notice your breathing, maybe my attention goes wild too much. Maybe one where I'm squeezing, where I'm following my finger, where I'm tensing my muscle, maybe that's easier for my attention. So that's fine. That might be your style. So it's not that mindfulness can't work. Maybe it's, you haven't found the right type. Or maybe I really don't like this breathing strategies, but I love nature watching. So it's about finding kind of what's right for you. That's a very good point. Um, well, we are at five today. Thank you so much, Dr. Adriana Panting. Uh, we, we had such a great time listening to you and getting to ask you questions and especially learning the strategies from you. Um, uh, everyone, once you close today's Zoom, there should be a window that opens up and it'll let you see a survey and, and you can share your thoughts with us along with recommendations for topics you'd like us to address. And you can request Dr. Panting's slides that way too, so I know to send them to you. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that tomorrow at uh, three to four, we are hosting um, a second or not a second, another webinar called Introduction to Somatic Movement for Spine Mobility and Posture. It'll be hosted by or it'll be hosted by us. And we are hosting Diana Lara Rogers, who is. Um, works with Unlock on 35th Street. So we're really excited for that. She will be showing you exercises. And just like today, we'll be doing some of, um, we'll be doing practicing. Sorry, we'll be practicing some of the um, exercises that she'll share with us. So a lot of strategies and exercises for wellness this week. And I, I really hope that you all can join us tomorrow. Um, The information will be included in uh, the post-event email that you all should receive after this. It'll include um, a link to where you can find today's presentation recording, and it should be uploaded within about a week or so onto our website. And um, along with other resources that I can connect you to. We have mindful eating here taught at a community health resource center. So just as Dr. Panting mentioned that mindfulness can come in many forms, but we also do mindfulness eating, which can help you take control of your eating and control hunger. Um, and, and then begin a healthier relationship with eating in general. Um, and uh, 
Dr. Panting, do you want to leave our participants with anything before we end? No, thank you all for um, for joining me, whether it's live now or whether you're watching this later. Um, and hopefully, hopefully it all makes sense once you get the slides. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you.